The following is an Ice on Mars presentation. Reverend, you have a visitor. He couldn't remember when he fell in love with the pain, when agony first turned to pleasure and then to joy. Of course, it hadn't always been like this. He remembered screaming all those years ago when first they put him in this cell. Those memories were vague, though, like reflections in a dusty mirror. So begins World on Fire, Book One, Raven's Peak, by Lincoln Cole. This episode on Dread Dialectic. Dread Dialectic. Yeah, here we are, episode nine. Very exciting. This is Michael T. Bradley. And Skix Medics. And we are here with, as I promised, a bit of a format change. Because, as you can probably imagine, trying to do, like, a book a week, both of us reading it, uh, it gets a little difficult and everything. So what we're going to do going forward is we're going to try alternating who's actually reading the book and talking about it. And the other uh, person is going to be here to discuss it and maybe ask pointed questions and not exactly lead the discussion, but but steer it right. in some places. I, I read this week's book and uh, got it again from Insta Freebie, which you've heard me talk about on here before. Uh, I, I really recommend checking it out. Even if you don't like the stuff, all you gotta do is unsubscribe from somebody's email list and uh, delete it off your Kindle uh, or Nook. Before we get into the book itself, I want to just, as usual, pimp out our email address. Yay. Uh, if you agree, disagree, or if you have suggestions for things for us to read, shoot us a note, dread.dialectic at gmail.com. And I guess going forward, if you're submitting something of your own that you would like us to check out, you might want to suggest who you would prefer reads it. Uh, you, you've hopefully gotten kind of a taste of what our our tastes are so far that that sentence didn't come out uh, in the best way michael mostly doesn't like things and i am very picky <laughs> i think i like the more kind of conventional old school uh, and by old school i mean like late 80s early 90s horror and i think you prefer the kind of more adventurous avant-garde sort of stuff yes i i am also uh, when I say picky, I mean picky about the writing. My English teacher self is reading alongside me. I can't help it. Oh boy, I was a professional editor for five years, mm. and so, especially this episode, we're going to see that side of me come out. <laughs> Just as a general note to all of you writers out there, I get what it's like how putting on an editor's hat is different than putting on a writer's hat, but get a copy editor. Everybody, yes, please. Not yourself. No matter how good you are, not yourself. Because things just don't read in your own head like they will to someone else. Anyway, Raven's Peak. Let's let's discuss Raven's Peak by Lincoln Cole here. What do you say? So a summary of this book is a little difficult because it is very straightforward, but it also kind of hops around in a way that's difficult to describe. Just super basic. It's kind of your typical action movie buddy cop sort of tale there's our intro character hatim who is i pictured him as like just fresh out of college but at one point he mentions that he thinks the other main character is in her early 20s and he's older than her so i assume he's maybe fresh out of grad school and uh, he is suffering uh, a bit of a crisis of faith and has just come back from visiting his parents in India because his younger sister has died of cancer. Some crazy shit happens and he is rescued by Abigail, who is a woman who it turns out is a hunter, um, like a demon hunter working for the council. Uh, we don't really know a lot about them at this point. And Abigail is sent on an assignment to a small town called Raven's Peak. And Hatim tags along for the journey. They're tested through various means. All right, so let's start with the good. Tell us the good, baby. So I did like the fact that our two main characters are Hatim, uh, who's from India, and Abigail, who uh, it's mentioned many times is uh, an African-American woman. And I thought that was pretty cool that we have two non-white main characters in this story. Like, it doesn't play into their characters that much. Uh, Hatim's family comes up a fair amount, but, I mean, essentially, they could be white, and it would make no difference, so I thought it was cool that Lincoln decided to make them non-white, just, you know, because why not? Get some more representation out there, right? 
another good thing, I think it is a gorgeous cover. It looks a hell of a lot like a cover from the comic Postal, which I really like. Uh, that was actually what made me interested in it. The other thing I'll say is that there is a, I, I'm pretty sure it's free, a free sort of prologue story before this novel. I think it's called The Ninth Circle. The Ninth Circle takes place about 20 years previous to this plot and focuses on it's it's just a little short story really about the character who we see in the prologue here and how he saves abigail as a kid and i read that story and literally here is the story guy goes into a building beats up demon after demon after demon expecting to die but keeps living and at the end of it is like hey little girl <laughs> And, and I was like, this is the most basic, boring-ass story ever. But I it kept my interest for the, I don't know, 30 or whatever pages that it lasted. How, how is the, uh, the fighting written? Pretty basic and pretty straightforward. Like, the fight scenes did not blow me away. It was just kind of like, another demon came out from the hallway. He punched it. It went down. <laughs> <laughs> this is something that I think we'll find a decent amount with the stuff from Insta Freebie is... Uh, or, or just in general, things that aren't professionally published is that, you know, you did not like Talion as much as I did, and both of us thought that it had some kind of overarching flaws. But the prose itself, you, you thought it was a bit too flowery, and she didn't color mm -hmm. darlings and everything, but overall, I, I think you felt like she had a good grasp of the English language, correct? Yeah, I, I, I think with the help of the right editor, she would have been amazing. This, however, I, I feel as if it wasn't edited or was maybe like handed to a buddy to edit or something like that. I love the punching. It was sick, dude. <laughs> Let's go ahead and slide into the bad. I really kind of feel bad for picking on this book, but I think it's going to set an example for anyone who's thinking about sending something in and anybody who's thinking about publishing in general. So here's the thing. I have divided my notes into three sections <laughs> of bad. And I will just start with the first one. The first one is grammar. Lincoln doesn't seem to understand grammar in a lot of places. And again, I think this is because when you have your writer hat on, you just don't necessarily think about these things. And so this points out the reasons for good copy editor. Mm -hmm. A few examples here. It sounded way more plausible than demons being real. Demons has an apostrophe S on it, so what yeah. belonged to the demon in that sentence that made it need an apostrophe? Also, on that same note, twice somebody says, Heavens no, but there's an apostrophe on heaven? <laughs> the, the no of heaven. Uh, an ancient Chinese concept. It's quite beautiful. And the being of demon, I guess. <laughs> uh, on to the dumpster. Dumpster is used multiple times and it's never capitalized. If you're using dumpster or Kleenex, it is a brand name. <sighs> Roll your eyes, but do it. A pair of pigeons were scared up as it passed. P-A-S-T. So... <laughs> <laughs> the pigeons were like, oh my god, uh, time is ephemeral. <laughs> Scared up is a little not quite right. I want to know why? Question mark, a team replied. Oh, I hate that. <laughs> I want to know why is not a question. They think you're a good little soldier, behaving orders like you are supposed to. Behaving orders. I don't think you behave orders. <laughs> no, you o obeying. I, uh, or following. A word swap there yeah. or behaving like you are supposed to right i mean and yeah. any of those things are but you don't behave orders or just leave out orders behaving like you're supposed to yeah yeah but at one point i knew its name can you guess what has an unnecessary apostrophe in that sentence i'm gonna guess it's it's but i'd be happier if it were one of the other words <laughs> <laughs> that's right but at one point i knew it is name no <laughs> no you didn't you did not that's exactly how I read it, too. Quote, plus, unquote, she added, period. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of this stuff where it's like... And, and again, very similar. Quote, you, unquote, Abigail said, testing the door. It was locked, period. I, I want to go back to plus. Did, did Lincoln realize that there was a pun there? Plus, she added? Possibly. I didn't, I didn't even notice that until now because I just could not focus on anything beyond the fact that the sentence just stops there. I mean, that was my, my first notice as well, but then but then I got, like, plus added, huh? Uh, if... yeah. Uh, this also dry, drove me crazy because I was like, who thinks this? And suffice to say, mm. where's the it in that? It's suffice it to say. 
It's one where he's probably heard it spoken, where the it gets a bit elided when people say it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Suffice, um, apostrophe T, suffice. Like how I had a friend who thought it was for all intensive purposes, mm-hmm. like intensive care. Yeah, that's a common one. Let's talk about the fact how you claimed Richard Lehman spoke like an alien. I'll see your Richard Lehman uh, writes like an alien and say that Lincoln Cole writes like an alien from farther away. First off, he very <laughs> rarely uses contractions so that everybody sounds like their data from Star Trek. <laughs> Who, for some reason, was very intelligent but still wasn't programmed with contractions. This probably fits more under the grammar. They are going to grab you and bring you somewhere. Wherever that somewhere is, you're going to be there since they're bringing me to you. I mean, that's uh, the difference between bring and take, guys. Let's figure that out. Yeah. Okay, here's a quote. We passed a bar about a block back. I'm going to go check in there and see if there is anything interesting going on in town. That sounds like a perfectly normal conversation that human beings would have, right? (laughs) I just like the way you stress interesting. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, I don't know how to read that like I'm not a robot. I hear you, and and the first thing in that sentence that caught me up was the the alliteration at the beginning. Mm, A a bar about a block back? Yeah. When people are talking, they tend to not do that without stumbling. Hmm. Um, So it's it's a good idea to uh, read your dialogue allowed like i don't necessarily care about super realistic dialogue like i don't mind if people sound a little stilted at times or a little yeah or a little stylized yeah a little stylized but if you go i mean to robert altman and i get a little annoyed too but things like this also what if it has infected other people i doubt it can infect too many people in this short of a time frame Mm. it's like okay you get the point across, but now let's pretend a human said it, right? What if someone else got infected? Urgh, that sort of stuff just throws me out of the story. They couldn't have done it in such a short time, could they? I don't think so. It's been, it hasn't been long enough. It's going to take time to pass from person to person. You know, something, whatever. Not enough time, eh? Also, in general, if you're, start, if you're asking a question, take the do out of the beginning of it, right? Like, do you have any smokes versus you have any smokes? It was quiet and empty, which even for a town this small, it felt unnatural. Oh, that was awkward. The big bad of the story, which I won't reveal until we get to the ugly, uh, says this. Now, Abigail, it is time for you to die. <laughs> it is. And I assume he's not a robot. He's here. Right. And, and later it says, witness my victory. And... <laughs> That's a 50s comic book uh, villain there. (laughs) Right, and I'm actually okay with stuff like this as long as you do the Joss Whedon thing. Like, it's a setup for somebody to have a good comeback, right? But no, it's not. It's not. It doesn't. You did not just say that, you big cornball. Now I'm going to kick your ass. (laughs) Right, or like, you know, now, Abigail, it is time for you to die. Or like, now it's time for you to shut the hell up. How about, you know, (laughs) anything is better than just reacting like... Oh, you have spoken to me in normal human speech. No. (laughs) Oh. This one is just... I feel like somebody told him you need to take out semicolons and this happened. This (laughs) sentence. I need for you to delete everything on your computer, comma, the camera, comma, and on your cloud backups, comma, I'm heading out of town tonight, comma, and I can't afford to leave any loose ends. There's at least two sentences in there. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Okay. This last one in this section... So this is kind of a long one. Uh, Hatim at one point wakes up in a hospital and he's starting to get that this there's something going on here, right? There's something bigger than this really being a hospital. All right, he said, not entirely convinced. The doctor gestured with the clipboard again. Please sign. He hesitated. People hesitate in this book a lot. <laughs> That's a bad sign. A drinking game is every time it says somebody hesitated, take a shot. Do you mind if I sign a little later? after the pain goes away. We can give you some painkillers. No, he interrupted. No more drugs. I just need a few minutes to relax and recover. The doctor frowned at him for a second and then nodded. He pulled the clipboard back. Very well. I believe we'll have to gather some other paperwork for you as well, so we might as well get it at the same time and spare your shoulder the worst of it. Nurse? I'll grab him his lunch while I get the discharge paperwork ready, the nurse said. Very good. The doctor said. Very good. Uh... Again, it's this section where 
everything that you needed to get across was gotten across, but it just read like robots imitating human speech. Skix, have you read stuff like this where you feel like, like you're watching a puppet show rather than like actually imagining people interacting? Yeah, I mean, I, I've read stories that start out that way and I'm thinking, cool, it's gonna turn out that they're all aliens disguised <laughs> as humans and, it, it, and they don't and I like, wow, bogus. This is the main problem that I had through the entire book, is that everybody feels like a puppet, and Lincoln is maneuvering the puppet strings, and we're kind of watching a decent puppet show, but I never felt like Hatim or Abigail are real people. Right. Like, I could never imagine the sweat on her brow, or the tremble of his lips, or anything like that. It was always like, I will go check out this room now. Okay, you do that, she said. It's always that sort of stilted, on top of each other sort of stuff. It sounds like there there are a lot of gaps where there would be room for good character and story building detail. Like, even in that bit you read, there were, like, he hesitated. Don't say the character hesitated. Tell us what he did. Did he... Did he hold up his hand to stop the doctor from talking? Did he shove the clipboard away? Did he turn away? Did he fart? You know, we could know more about him. Uh, in in a in a brief second, if you just give us more than than uh, that that gap, I need to keep building my case <laughs> with this my third section, which is just plain old shitty prose. The prosecution may continue. Damn it! She growled, brushing loose hairs out of her face with a growl. Blah 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 blah. But it's like we yeah okay we get it. She's growling. Damn it. <laughs> On the one hand, it was hard to believe that demons and supernatural creatures could remain hidden, but on the other hand, it did sound plausible. <laughs> ha! That sounds like a really useful sentence. <laughs> one of his eyes was missing. Not missing like, arg, matey, but missing missing. <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> Is he trying to be cute there? Yeah, I think. So it's like, it wasn't a random pirate that he met. This was a man missing an eye. And it's like, well, I never would have thought, maybe he's a pirate. It sounds like he's going a bit uh, Buffy speak there, but it does, it's not what his style is anywhere else. Okay, and then there are things like this where, I don't know if Lincoln just was drinking heavily every now and then or what, but he gets into these moods. <laughs> Writers never do that. Let me, let me read you this paragraph. The air weighed heavy in the night, heavy and cold. It was a blanket of icy frost wrapping around one's soul, suffocating and overwhelming it, threatening to drag it to the pit of despair and cast it in. The night was full of the sort of emptiness that sapped strength and broke a man's will, filling even the hardiest of hearts with dread. That was, at least, how Hatim saw it. <laughs> oh, is that so overwrought? <laughs> Even if you forget the overwroughtedness <laughs> of it. The hardiest heart is funny. <laughs> you don't have to put in that last sentence. Obviously, that's how Hatim <laughs> saw it. You're doing third person limited for this entire book. And at this point, you're writing from Hatim's point of view. Calling attention to narration doing that. And... Uh... If you use one in your simile, don't. It wraps around one's soul. It, it makes it very yeah. stuffy in the middle of a bunch of florid. Again, from Hatim's point of view, so why isn't it just, it was a blanket of icy frost that wrapped around Hatim's soul or whatever, right? Yeah, that's even better. It felt like every now and then Lincoln was like, okay, shit, I gotta put some like real writer stuff in here at this <laughs> point. And he will often call it out. He's got some of the tools, but he doesn't know how to use them all together, I think. So you were saying, like, there seem gaps where you could put things in. I, I think this highlights my biggest problem, and I'll, I'll use this one last quote here to point it out. He does this a lot. Abigail was silent for a long moment, watching the little girl play. My father. That's what she says. It's three stars, next section starts. Hmm. What? Abigail looked at him. It doesn't matter. And it's like, just on its own, not a huge deal, but he does this a lot of times where he ends a section or a chapter, and then just starts the next section or chapter with the next sentence. So there's no point in breaking it. I mean, there are always these little mini climaxes or whatever, but it's like, this isn't big enough to cut, in my opinion. What really needed to be cut was most of these scenes. He feels as if he has to follow his characters through every step of what they're doing at every point, 
for like the entire five or whatever days that this book takes place during. We don't need to follow, you know, like then he went into the restroom, <laughs> squeezed a bit of toothpaste onto his toothbrush, and then he walked back out, and then he asked Abigail how she was doing, and she said fine, but he thought that maybe she was... Don't need that. The book starts around 50% in. That drives me nuts. Like, there's this, there's about 10% of it, because I'm always watching the percentages on the Kindle, about 10% of it is this prologue scene, which is semi-interesting, because it, it kind of sets up Abigail's entire point, basically. But then we don't get to Raven's Peak until 66% of the way through the book. We have a brief interlude in Raven's Peak at 50% of the way through the book, which it's called, like, Interlude, Raven's Peak. And I'm like, when the title of your book is Raven's Peak, you don't want an interlude taking place in Raven's yeah. Peak. The weird thing is that Interlude, Raven's Peak, is the best part of the book. It's a really great chapter. It's a, it's a nice little semi-creepy section that makes you realize, like, okay, this is what our main characters are up against. This is cool. Why wasn't this 100 pages earlier, you right. know? Yeah, so that's my biggest frustration with it, is that I just feel like he focuses on the mundane all the time, makes everyone sound like puppet robots, and didn't get where the focus of the story should be. Because underneath it all, I did kind of enjoy the story. It's kind of this, you know, Abigail's part of this, like, Buffy-esque sort of council that hunts down demons and possibly other things, though it's never really clear exactly how much is out there. And Hatim gets embroiled in this overall adventure, right? Mm -hmm. The title's a little silly. It seems like the name of a D&D &D campaign. It's hard for me to take it seriously with that as my starting point. An encounter at Raven's Peak, an adventure for adventurers levels 3 through 5. <laughs> so let's talk about the ugly. Yay. Uh, we find out that Hatim's father is a member of the council, and Hatim's father has kept this entire world secret from him. She is, so for whatever reason, Abigail takes a team with her to Raven's Peak, and she just thinks it's going to be something stupid, and she'll get it out of the way, and then uh, she'll get him back to safety or whatever. There are all of these little fun things, like there's this guy at the beginning who, you know, quote-unquote, overhears Hatim talking in the library to somebody he used to know in college, saying that he's out of work currently and he doesn't know what to do with his life. And this guy comes up and is like, hey, if you, I, I think this woman's trying to kill me. Would you follow her and help me gather evidence for the police? And we find out that this guy is actually Abaddon the Destroyer. And he's, wow, uh, he, he marks uh, Hatim to use him as his vessel after his current vessel dies. And then that plot is just kind of thrown out the window, and maybe it's going to come back later. This is like book one of either a trilogy or a series. Later on, the demon infesting the town is in the body of this little boy, and he kind of drives other people crazy. Again, I felt like that could have been the focus of the story. A lot of things could have been the focus of the story, but instead it's mostly them riding around and Hatim constantly being like, what? <laughs> like, at one point, like, I mean, he's now at this point seeing dead people knows about the demons are there and has encountered a few and been in a couple been near a couple of fights and she says I'm a hunter and he's like what and I'm like come on dude like he's never caught a single episode of supernatural wouldn't you kind of put two and two together under those circumstances if you said you were a hunter I would not assume you meant deer the end of the book Hatim has a character arc that goes from zero to 60 in a page. Like, his his entire thing through the entire book is like, oh, I'm scared and I don't understand what's going on and I'm so innocent and yada yada yada. And like, at the end of the book, he's like, Hey, Dad, stop the airstrike that's happening to this town because I'm here. Don't kill me. And he's like, Oh my God, I've never under stood up to my dad. Anyway, now I'm going to go two buildings over and stand up to a demon because he becomes like a magical cleric, essentially. Like, he finds his faith again because of dealing with these demons and exercises this demon. And it really felt like, oh shit, we're getting a D&D &D party together here. <laughs> like, I thought there were a lot of cool little bits and I thought, oh, this is a world that I would enjoy reading stuff in, but I felt like this probably could have been a good first hundred pages. Like, rather than a trilogy, this should have been one book that was maybe a little bit bigger, and we should have focused a bit more on other things, you know, maybe at most a duology or whatever. Or this should have been the first book, and we should have paid a lot more attention to, like, 
while the stuff was going on with Hatim and Abigail, we A, focus more on things that are important and do things in those gaps that you were talking about mm -hmm. that give the characters pop, and then we should have been focusing a hell of a lot more on Raven's Peak and kind of the descent into insanity over there. Right. Instead, it's just like this kid gets taken over and we see him whisper to one character, then essentially within two chapters of them having arrived in town, people are naked and screaming in the streets, and it's like there was no ramp up to this. This just kind of happened. So 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 their their definition of insane or crazy is being naked and screaming? Are they also violent or what? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. They're shooting at each other naked and screaming, of course. I, I tried very hard to find a way to make this constructive rather than negative, so I hope that we have at least partially succeeded in that. I would not recommend this to friends. What what about for adaptation into a D and D campaign? <laughs> Maybe you could um, adopt this and make a cool movie out of it, as long as you kept, like, only just about 10% of the story. I mean, cut out all the, the, the empty between stuff, and it sounds like it might actually have, have some, uh, some moviness about it. It really does feel like he used, like, I don't know, one of the lethal weapons or something like that as kind of a blueprint for how to do it. That was another thing that I, I, I'll admit, I did like the fact that there didn't seem to be any sort of romance developing between these two characters. They were just two characters who were kind of thrust into a situation and interacted off of each other. Oh my so. god. Next week, Skix will take on Carmilla, and we'll talk about that. But until then, please feel free to write us at dread.dialectic at gmail.com with any thoughts, suggestions, comments, feedback. Till then, this is Michael T. Bradley. And this is Skix Maddox. We are. <laughs>